Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to the 50 Years Ago in Hockey podcast. This is our 114th weekly episode. I'm your host, Rick Cole, and yes, we are back after a rather unpleasant and continuing battle with the COVID-19 virus. And we hope that for the rest of this hockey season, we'll be able to bring you each week right here on the Hockey Podcast, our trips down memory lane back 50 years ago when we report on all the hockey news at that time exactly as it was reported by some of the greatest and some of the worst sports writers of all time. Right now, we're going to talk about the first couple weeks of January 1972. If you like what we do here every day on Twitter and each week on the Hockey Podcast Network, you can help us out by going to patreon.com slash hockey 50 years and subscribe to the podcast. Subscribers not only get early access to each week's free podcast, but we have some really neat stuff and special content where we allow ourselves to dive more deeply and in greater detail to the stories that dominated the hockey world 50 years ago. And of course, in 1972, that means lots of WHA stuff and Summit Series later on in the years. So we have a lot of special features on these uh, items for the Patreon folks planned for this month, including some uh, some interesting historical stories I know you won't find anywhere else. That's patreon.com slash hockey 50 years. First off this week, we want to apologize for our absence of the past month or so. We, and that is my entire family living in the household right now, came down with COVID-19. Just a few weeks before Christmas, you can probably hear it in my voice. I'm practically shouting today. Uh, the disease affected each of us differently and was almost more than we can handle for a while there. Had we not all been fully vaccinated, I really shudder to think of what the outcome may have been. I'm still being adversely affected owing to the fact that I am a diabetic and the virus uh, seems to be unduly hard on those of us who suffer with that. Uh, had many co- lengthy conversation with my doctor about it as well. He told me that as a diabetic, it's going to take longer for me to uh, to heal. I'm hoping my voice is up to putting out this episode. We're going to give it a shot. We might not go as long as other weeks. And my energy, uh, that was one of the things that really affected me, is still very, very low. But we're working really hard at getting as back to normal as we can. Uh, it, I'm not going to bore you with all the uh, symptoms that we, that we suffered, other than to say that it really wasn't very pleasant, and I'm still not up to speed. Uh, I'm having trouble actually remembering everything that happened. One of the things that got me was I was in a, a brain fog most of the time. I wasn't able to to uh, focus on the tasks that I wanted to do, which is why I couldn't put out the podcast. We're a little better with that now. And of course, the voice was completely gone. This is the best it's been since before Christmas. So we're going to try and, uh, like I say, we'll muddle through with this. Anybody has any questions about what it's like to have COVID, I am, I'd am. love to try and answer them for you. I can tell you this. It is real. Be safe. You do not want to get this shit. So what we're trying to do this week is summarize as best we can what took place in the first few weeks of 1972. Now the year 1972 would be a year like no other in the history of hockey and that's for a lot of reasons. A new allegedly major hockey league would arrive on the scene with all the accompanying repercussions that would shake the hockey establishment to its very core. And the other major event among many major events in 1972, maybe far more important than even the advent of the WHA, would be the Summit Series as it came to be known between Canada and the Soviet Union in September. Ordinarily, I don't give much attention to international hockey, especially at that time in history, because to me, it was completely irrelevant because under the ground rules in which games had to be played as set by the International Ice Hockey Federation. But this series 
was a defining moment for Canadians and Canadian hockey. And it turns out, although we had no idea while it was being planned, that a lot more was riding on this thing than any of us could possibly have realized. We'll try and provide for you as we go along this year a chronological history of how the series came to be as we... Uh, got the reports as they came in. A lot was going on in the background that we didn't hear about for a long time. And uh, we'll talk about what everyone thought of it as the preparations were being made to play the games and, of course, reaction around the globe to the results when the series finally was played. And we'll give these as reported by the most important journalists of the time, both in and outside of the world of sports. The year 1972 is going to be quite a ride, my friends, and we hope we'll be able to provide to you a front row seat to what was at that time the greatest show on earth. And by the way, years later, that is how I described my job as a police officer during an interview with a journalist at that time in the uh, 70s, 80s, and 90s. So in this high-level overview, the early part of January, we'll try and we'll pick one story from every day to begin uh, with January 1st, of course. We had Jim Proudfoot of the Toronto Star giving us a bit of a review of a book released by New York Rangers defenseman Brad Park featuring what a lot of us figured were some outlandish quotes by the young Ranger defenseman. The best chapter by far of Brad Park's outspoken new book, Play the Man, is the one in which he tells how he feels about the Boston Bruins. To sum it up concisely, Brad Park despises the Boston team. He doesn't like the city of Boston either, for that matter, or the Boston Garden, or the fans who inhabit that hallowed hall. Most of all, though, he abhors the Bruins themselves rather passionately. Brad Park is 23 years old and in his fourth National Hockey League season on defense for the New York Rangers. And I really don't know what that qualifies him as an expert in anything, but so be it. He wrote a book. He wrote The Man in collaboration with Stan Feschler, a a, uh, alleged Manhattan journalist. Uh, And he says what they produced, this is what Jim Proudfoot says, what they produced is very strong stuff indeed and very likely to affect the atmosphere in Madison Square Garden tomorrow evening when the Bruin fans visit the Rangers. Of course, that's the Ranger fans that could actually or would bother to read a book. Park bluntly dismisses Derek Sanderson as strictly a verbal warrior, a tough talker, but no threat fistically and not to be taken seriously. And do not forget those two tangled several times when they played in the Ontario Hockey Association Junior A Series, Park with Toronto Marlboro, Sanderson with the Niagara Falls Flyers. Possibly even worse than Sanderson, Park writes, is Johnny McKenzie. His bag is running at people from behind. No player really objects to getting hit straight on, but when a guy rams you from behind, that's bad news. McKenzie symbolizes the Bush style of Boston Hockey Club, and it's one that will eventually catch up to them. Just not in 1972, Brad. Park goes on to say Boston is like the schoolyard bully push the little guy around as long as the little guy won't fight back but when the little guy fights back the bully he doesn't know what to do that happens to the Bruins you must play their game lay the wood on them and get them thinking about getting hurt the Bruins have two different styles of play park figures at home According to Brad, they're bloodthirsty animals, but on the road, they're just a good, strong hockey team. The big, bad Bruins image is one that has been cultivated carefully by Boston management. Supporting that claim, Park says players undergo weird transformations when they move to Boston. Take Kenny Hodge, Brad suggests. When he played for Chicago, he was a relatively peaceful skater whose primary aim was scoring. And in Chicago, he didn't do that much. But as a Bruin, he suddenly started picking fights all 
over the place. Park even lectures Boston's Ted Green, who almost died after a stick fight during the 1969 preseason series, and he missed the entire season. Many people believe Green got exactly what he deserved, Park says, because he was nothing more than a hatchet man, and there's no two ways about it. After he recovered and returned to the NHL, I thought he might have learned something from his experience, but he hasn't. Ted Green is still carrying that stick high and doing the same dumb things he was doing before he got hurt. One of the uh, livelier guessing games around the NHL, according to Boston Globe sports writer, hockey writer, Tom Fitzgerald, uh, involves the probable groupings of the 16 teams with the induction of the new entries, Long Island and Atlanta, next October. The first plan of the Board of Governors is for four divisions, although you shouldn't necessarily count on that being put into effect, says Tom Fitzgerald. In case the overlords of hockey do pursue that initial intention, here is the Ray, one strictly unofficial gathering of kibitzers, sports writers talking things over, speculated on how it's going to work out with uh, out complications from the NHL's curious sense of geography. Tom doesn't name names here like Northwest, East, South, like the NHL probably would. Of course, the NHL lacks complete vision, ingenuity, creativity to come up with names that don't mean something geographically. So we'll call them A, B, C, D. Division A would be Boston, New York, Philadelphia, and Pittsburgh. Eh, Not bad. Division B, Montreal, Toronto, Detroit, and Long Island. Division C has Chicago, Minnesota, Buffalo, and Atlanta. This ensures that Buffalo has some team they'll be able to beat. And Division D, St. Louis, Vancouver, California, and the Los Angeles Kings. Now, before anybody raises a holler, let's admit that the last one at the moment represents quite a collection of weak sisters. A little more bluntly, losers. Because there will be difficulties of this nature and a lot of strong wills hauling and tugging in every direction, it's not likely that this decision will be resolved as hoped by the time the All-Star Game in Minnesota later this month. In fact, Bill Wirtz of the Chicago Blackhawks, the owner there, says that there's the possibility of so much conflict that the governors might all just settle for two 18 divisions, just like the old Major League Baseball, eight in the American, eight in the National League. Now, you should pay some attention to Bill Wirtz's opinion, too, because he is chairman of the board, the board of governors of the NHL, that is, and he is a strong voice in the council of the owners, especially now that Con Smythe isn't around to call him a dog in a manger, as he did at least once in board meetings back in the day. If they do go for the eight-team setup, mull over these possibilities. The East Division would be Boston, Toronto, Montreal, New York, Philadelphia, Buffalo, Pittsburgh, and Long Island in the West, Chicago, Minnesota, St. Louis, Detroit, Vancouver, Los Angeles, California, and that far western city of Atlanta. That puts a lot of the real power in the East again, but there'll be a deep feeling about maintaining the natural direct rivalries of the league's old teams. One of the bigger stories of early January uh, is reported by Milt Dunnell of the Toronto Star. It involves the ownership control of Maple Leaf Gardens and the Toronto Maple Leafs Hockey Club. Milt writes, a dog fight for control of Maple Leaf Gardens and the Maple Leaf Hockey Club was threatened between Harold Ballard, of the president of the gardens, and members of the Smythe family. Both factions, however, denied that a showdown was completely inevitable. Irritations and disagreements have been building up since the death of Stafford Smythe in October. Stafford, son of the gardens founder Con Smythe, was president of Maple Leaf Gardens at the time of his death. He and Ballard owned approximately 75% of the garden stock between them. Ballard said, he told uh, Dunnell, I had a written agreement with Stafford that in the event of his death or my death, the survivor would have the right to vote the other's stock. Originally, this agreement applied to Stafford, 
John Bassett and Harold Ballard. However, since Bassett sold all of his garden stock to Harold and Stafford, the agreement no longer applied to him, and some lawyers would say that that would nullify the agreement altogether. Ballard says that he had the same agreement with Con Smythe when he was running the gardens, and it's all in writing. Ballard went on to say that now the Smythes are not willing to honor the agreement. I already had an offer from my stock from a person whom I do not intend to identify. Ballard said there's no doubt in his mind, though, that this guy who made him the offer was fronting for the Smythes. Dr. Hugh Smythe, brother of the late Stafford, who became a vice president of the gardens shortly before Staff's death, admitted there had been some doubt whether Stafford's estate would permit the family to retain his stock, which had heavy claims against it. When Ballard and Stafford Smythe bought out Bassett last September, they did so with the loan of almost six million dollars from the Toronto Dominion Bank. We, Hugh Smythe said, the Smythe family, had to deal with the question of whether Stafford's block of shares would have to be sold after the disagreements in the Guardian's executive suites came out in the open. It now becomes clear that the Smythes are in the gardens to stay. Thus, the 10-year development of the gardens and the hockey club becomes increasingly important for us. I would not say there's open disagreement between us and Harold, Hugh Smythe said. He went on to say there are some things about which the Smythe family is very unhappy, and these are things that were being at uh, discussed right at that time. Hugh Smythe says, it was I who nominated Harold Ballard to be president of the gardens, and I would be pleased to have him stay there provided the gardens policies are consistent with what we believe they should be. We're going to see that in our interests, we are well represented. Of the 735,580 shares of garden stock, which have been issued, Ballard and the Smice account for 510,000, and Ballard himself owns 260,000 shares. January 5th saw a bombshell of a story out of Detroit that really shook up Red Wings fans and actually people all over uh, hockey. Reported by WXYZ Television, a Detroit station, uh, their uh, sports director is a fellow by the name of David Diles. He came out with a story that hockey star Gordy Howe, who retired earlier this year as a player, was reported to be severing all ties with the Detroit Red Wings, the only professional hockey employer he had ever known. Gordy and wife Colleen flew to Florida on January 4th to tell owner Bruce Norris, who's staying at his home Asasa Springs winter home, that he is stepping down as vice president of the organization. Dave Dial said, it's our understanding that Gordy is disenchanted with the way things are run at Olympia Stadium. He's very unhappy with the tasks assigned to him, and he's stepping aside and severing all ties with the Detroit organization. One of Gordy's hockey playing sons, Mark, 16 years old, said he didn't know anything about it. Mark said that everything seemed to have been going okay and he hasn't seen or heard anything about his dad's disenchantments. Red Wings officials, of course, were not available to uh, comment on the report. The Red Wing officials uh, just said they weren't available. A source close to the team said how told Bruce Norris he was resigning by telephone before leaving for Florida. Apparently there was a discussion between the two that took place and Bruce just told Gordy to get to Florida where they talk about it. Now Gordy the source in Detroit told Dave Niles doesn't want to pose as a title head. He doesn't like his job because he basically doesn't have anything to do and you don't do this to 
the greatest player in hockey history. The Canadians did it with Maurice Richard. That did not end well. And the Red Wings seems to be playing the same games with this. How the old white men that run hockey teams, uh, big league hockey teams, seem to operate. How specific duties as vice president of the organization have never been spilled out by club officials. Meanwhile, Joe Vargo of the team's publicity office said he had not heard any such rumor and that Howe just completed moving his stadium office from the back of the building to right up at the front. Well, the story made the rounds all over the NHL. That story we gave you was from United Press International. The Associated Press, a few hours later, said that Gordy had spiked the rumor that he's quitting his job as VP of the Red Wings, that he did say he hasn't felt totally involved with the National Hockey League team, and he hinted that there may be friction between him and other front office executives. Now, I just wonder what other front office executives Gordy could have been unhappy with. Maybe uh, Jim Bishop? Maybe Ned Harkness? Well, Howe was contacted at the Miami airport after he met with team owner Bruce Norris, and he said, I guess I was a little too strong when I told a couple friends I was going to Florida to see Bruce and see just what I was supposed to be doing for the hockey team. Probably that's how this thing got out of perspective, but really, Gordy emphasized, I am not quitting the Red Wings. Gordy said, if I wanted to be stronger than Bishop or Link, Lincoln Cavalieri, then I could be. But my office is in the PR now, and if they want to come and see me, well, that's just fine. They can come and see me. Now, the bishop that uh, Gordy mentioned is, as I said, Jim Bishop. He is the executive director of the Red Wings, who reportedly has had disputes with Howe and his wife, Colleen, over management of the NHL Wings and the Junior Detroit Red Wings, and the Howes are members of the Junior Red Wings Board of Directors. Link is Lincoln Cavallari, the general manager of Olympia Stadium, where Detroit plays its home games, and where Howe and other team executives have their offices. The 43-year-old Howe retired last September after 20 five years as a superstar right wing and they immediately named him as vice president of the team as well as vice president of Norris's National Investors Life Insurance Company and Norin Corporation which is a realty for him. Howe said he's been working on consolidating Norris's insurance agencies but Gordy says the process is slow and it's going to be least another two years. Well the Howe affair as it was uh, come to be called seemed to be somewhat diffused the next day in this statement by Gordy himself. Uh, Gordy was appointed director of public relations for the Red Wings by Norris. That came out as a result of their meeting and that seemed to have eased tensions but there are statements here that tell you exactly what was going on in this whole mess. Now uh, it was decided how it would be put in charge of public relations, but Gordy wasn't so sure about this. And, and, and what he wasn't sure about is, is if this is what he wanted in the, in the long run. Running public relations department has nothing to do with the hockey team. And Gordy wasn't going to be able to influence anyone with his uh, strategy either. Uh, Gordy did say, I am my own boss in this thing. Gordy said, there's only one man I have to report to, and that man is Bruce Norris. If anybody wants me to do something, they'll have to come to me, and then I'm only going to do it if I want to. Now, that means that if Jim Bishop or Lincoln Cavallari have requested how make a personal appearance or drum up some kind of a PR scheme, how can thumb his nose at him if he wants to? Gordy says, I am my own man now. Bruce has given me complete control of what I do and no one is going to interfere. So Gordy doesn't say how long he's going to be doing this. He doesn't see himself really remaining in this current position for much longer than a couple of years. Gordy ends his story by saying, when I retired, I had a dream that I would become involved in Bruce's insurance companies. And that's what I had been preparing for the last few years of my playing career anyway. So Gordy Howe remains with the Red Wings, but you can tell 
that it's a hot, stinking mess in the front offices at the Olympia Stadium in Detroit. Well, we're on to the divisional round of the NFL playoffs and DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the National Football League, is celebrating with a huge odds boost for new customers. Counting down to Super Bowl 56, new customers can get 56 to 1 odds on any team. That's right. Just bet $5 and get 280 in free bets if your team wins. If if Sportsbook isn't available in your state yet, you can still get in on the action of the divisional round. Everyone can play for huge cash prizes with the DraftKings Daily Fantasy Football Contest. DraftKings has given all new customers a free shot at millions of dollars in total prizes with their first deposit. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app right now. Use promo code THPN for the Hockey Podcast Network and get 56 to 1 odds on any NFL team. Bet just $5 and win 280 in free bets if your team wins. That's promo code THPN for 56 to 1 odds at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. You must be 21 or older. This is New Jersey, Indiana, or Pennsylvania only, and only for new customers. A $5 minimum deposit and $1 wager are required. Only one per customer, and there are some restrictions that do apply. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for all the details. Have a gambling problem? Please call 1-800-GAMBLER. On January 7th, Canadian press uh, carried a story that involved Punch Imlach, the general manager coach of the Buffalo Sabres and one of the more outspoken and controversial personalities in the entire hockey world. Punch Imlach, coach and general manager of the Buffalo Sabres, according to Canadian press, was taken to a Buffalo hospital after complaining of feeling ill. Paul Whelan, the public relations director of the NHL club, said that Imlach hadn't collapsed or fainted, but that he complained of feeling faint and he was pale and drawn looking. But Whelan said, as Punch is, he was still talking when he left here. He wasn't talking much, but he was still talking. Red Burnett followed that up the very next day with a story that Punch had suffered a mild heart attack at his offices at Memorial Auditorium the previous day. Burnett reported that Punch was reported to be in satisfactory condition in the coronary case unit of Deaconess Hospital in Buffalo to where he was rushed after complaining of chest pains. Punch has suffered a mild heart attack and will be in hospital for two Two or three weeks to Dr. George Collins, a cardiologist and a Sabre team director who has been treating the former Maple Leaf general manager coach. He is an excellent frame of mind, said Dr. Collins. He's taken news of his benching better than most people would expect, but he's not going to be allowed visitors for 10 days at least. The doctor says that Imlac is going to have to take it easy at his home for a few weeks after being released from hospital. So in the meantime, while the uh, punch is going to be off off duty, I guess you're going to have to say, people are going to have to run things. Here's what's going to happen. Joe Crozier is going to take over as the bench boss, the coach of the Sabres until Punch is able to return to that job. And we don't know if he'll even be back this season. Floyd Smith, who retired as a player this season, has been helping him lack with the coaching chores. He's been dispatched to Cincinnati to take over the American Hockey League farm team there. That's where Joe was coaching and general manager. Floyd Smith's going to take over that job. And the interim general manager until Punch gets back will be Freddie Hunt, who served as the general manager of the American Hockey League, Buffalo Bisons, for many years. And one of these days, I'll tell you a very funny story. Well, it wasn't funny at the time about Freddie Hunt and Ed Chadwick. So Punch him lack in hospital for the next few weeks due to a heart attack and uh, 
at that time we were all wishing him the best and hoping he'd get well real soon and he did and one of the other big stories at the same time that punch took ill was the near riot that took place in philadelphia during a hockey game between the st louis blues and the philadelphia flyers a riot that ended up uh, moving into the stands as the blues confronted philadelphia patrons and the whole scene ended up with coach al arbor the blues and three players being arrested and carted off to a police station in a paddy wagon Philadelphia sports columnist Frank Dolson has a very interesting report that he wrote on this. Uh, He was disgusted by the whole thing. You'll be able to tell that, I think. But I'm going to read this to you the way he wrote it, just to give you a perspective of a Philadelphia writer. This happened right in his city. Here's how the, the report starts. The videotape replay, courtesy Channel 29, showed it clearly. There was Bob Plager of the St. Louis Blues trying to climb the railing, trying to get at the fans in the stands. There was Barkley Plager reaching up with his hockey stick, swinging at the man and missing him. There was Phil Roberto, number 17, slashing at the same fan he didn't miss. The blade of the stick hit the spectator in the back of the left hand, almost certainly breaking it. The man recoiled in pain and backed away from the smart uh, from the smarting stick swinging mob. A policeman attempted to pull Bob Flager off the railing and shoved the crowd of St. Louis hockey players out of the runway at the east end of the spectrum. Roberto reached out suddenly and threw a punch at the officer with his left hand. Dolson writes, "This is hockey in Philadelphia. A smoke bomb exploding on the ice." during a free-for-all in a Philadelphia St. Louis playoff game. A Boston player climbing into the stands to get at spectators who had insulted him during a Saturday matinee. Golf balls flying out of the balcony during a Philadelphia-Chicago playoff game. The target, Bobby Hull, one of the game's all-time greats. And now this. Thursday night's bloody brawl at the Spectrum may have been a new low in Philadelphia hockey. Some of the fans loved it, but not all of them, not even most of them, but enough of them probably, the same animals probably, who think it's good to fire golf balls at the unprotected head of a, quote, enemy star. The same animals who were threatening to ruin a great sport by turning into something vicious and dirty, sort of a roller derby on ice. And you know what? There were members of the governors of the National Hockey League that wanted to see exactly that happen. Yes, this is hockey in Philadelphia. It's a visiting coach disputing a call with a referee at the end of a period, getting doused with beer, getting his head cracked open by a billy club, and finally walking out of a police station at five in the morning with his hands handcuffed behind his back. The first beer went on Al Arbor, said a local attorney who was sitting in section 20 with a bird's eye view of the entire ugly affair and it was poured down the back of his head and neck this brought great laughter from the people upstairs the attorney who requested that his name be withheld was upset over what he had seen and heard and concerned over the brutality displayed by some of philadelphia's hockey fans and at least one philadelphia policeman arbor was pushed from behind the eyewitness in section 20 said he appeared to be pushed by a policeman the st louis coach was face to face with one officer hesitated and put the stick down another Another officer pulled out a blackjack, held it by Arbor's head, but he didn't hit him with it. Now, at that point, it was a full-scale riot involving more than a dozen St. Louis players. Hockey sticks and billy clubs flailed. Blood flowed. Some of these frenzied fans actually wanted more. A fan, a big man with long hair and a beard, wearing a wool plaid coat, grabbed Unger, Blue Center Gary Unger, by his hair. The lawyer said that got quite a bit of laughter, too. And his voice trailed off. But Unger didn't laugh. He looked to me. The man almost pulled him off his feet, the eyewitness said. Unger got livid. He he motioned to the fan. The guy made an attempt to throw a folding chair at him. He lifted it to shoulder level. But I guess he didn't throw it. 
Before the battle ended, before Thursday night's poor excuse for a sports event was completed, there were more casualties than goals. Two players, four fans, at least two policemen. No wonder the man in Section 20 called it, quote, a disgusting display. Yet, this is hockey in Philadelphia. It is the president of the Flyers, Joe Scott, accosting the vice president of the Blues, Lynn Patrick, in the Spectrum press room a few minutes after the battle ended. Scott was angry because the game was being delayed to give the uh, St. Louis players a chance to sharpen their skates. Shut up, Patrick told him. I don't have to shut up, Scott retorted. When you try and beat the police up, you're in the wrong city. Well... You're in the right city, damn right. We've taken it from you from the Blues for four years, and we ain't going to take it much more. And so, and so it went. To the fan brutality and the police brutality and the front office vulgarity, you'd have thought this was World War III they were fighting. Not a game between two particularly bad national hockey league teams. Ah, uh, but this is hockey in Philadelphia. It's the visiting coach. Ten stitches in his head and three of his players, one of them, John Arbor, with an even bigger wound, being led to a police station after a game. And it's Sidney Solomon Jr., the Blues president, following them. Ordinarily, there might have been a small victory party on this night. There was a long wait in a small room. They kept me sitting in that room until five in the morning, Solomon said. They treated us like absolute criminals. Now at this point, Solomon was home, the worst was over, but his voice still throbbed with anger. The police acted as if his men were guilty. Four policemen pressed charges. After a reasonable time, they let them, the officers that is, go home. But four blues, the president of the blues, remained in that small room. We guaranteed we'd be there for a trial on February 7th on charge of assault and battery and police officers, disorderly conduct, etc., Solomon said. We assured them we'd stand trial. We weren't thugs. We weren't criminals. We weren't going to run away. No, they weren't thugs. They weren't criminals. They were just a bunch of angry Canadians who threw punches at policemen, slashed at fans with their hockey sticks, and in a couple of cases got clobbered with billy clubs. So they sat there, along with the head of their hockey club, waiting for the wheels of justice to turn in the wee hours of the morning. We didn't need or anything, said the Blues president. Finally, the wait ended. It was time to see the magistrate. The lieutenant came in and made the men, they were Al Arbor, John Arbor, Phil Roberto, and Floyd Thompson, and I neglected to mention Floyd, he was actually the fourth player. He made them stand up, put their hands behind their backs, and he handcuffed them. The lawyer from Section 20, he says, I certainly didn't go out to see what I saw last night. I don't know if I'd take my wife to another hockey game. I don't know if I'd want to subject her to it or myself. No wonder. If this is what hockey has become in Philadelphia, maybe road or derby ain't so bad after all. Found some interesting news on January 10th. A St. Paul, Minnesota newspaper reported that three National Hockey League players, Kenny Dryden, Phil Roberto, and Stan Gilbertson, had all signed with the World Hockey Association. The report stated that all three had inked deals with the league and not with any individual team. Of course, in the next few days, there was a lot of discussion about this. All three of the players denied any such agreements with the new league, although Ken Dryden did admit having been contacted by the WHA, but he also said he much preferred to stay with the established NHL and he really couldn't see himself moving to the new league. Five days later, the WHA was in the news again. Actually, all over the place. Uh, Scotty Monroe, he is the president of the Calgary Centennials Western Canada Hockey League Junior A team. He's also going to run the Calgary franchise in the WHA. He told reporters that there had been a, a meeting out in Los Angeles and that all 12 
WHA franchises, including the ones in New York and Ontario, had paid the required league membership fees, making their membership in the league basically now official. In the case of the New York team, the original owner, uh, New York lawyer Neil Shane, he exited the scene basically saying he, he couldn't uh, ice a team because he had nowhere to play the games, even though dates had been offered by Bill Jennings, the president of the Rangers, for Madison Square Garden. And the new Long Island arena apparently also said that they would make some dates available to the team. Nonetheless, Shane left left the team, the, the WHA team, although he said he was continuing with the antitrust lawsuit he was uh, filing. He was replaced by another New York lawyer, a fellow by the name of Woods, and he arranged for the team to play g games at Madison Square Garden. So with the team place to play, the money was uh, put up, and New York had a team, the WHA, had to be really happy about that. Now, the Ontario team was in a bit more nebulous situation. They were unable to get approval from the city of Hamilton to build a new rink in the east end of the city, uh, Barton Street and Centennial Parkway, Highway 20, was the proposed location, and that was on land owned by Basil Griffiths, a businessman from nearby St. Catharines. Well, they couldn't get the city to approve the rink, mainly because it was a case of guys of a hockey team wanting the city to build a rink for them. Well, they said they would build the rink, but the city would have to take it over and run it and do all the dirty work that comes with running an arena, and the city didn't want to get into that business. So Doug Michelle, now the owner of the Ontario team, his partner, 23-year-old Jim McCreeth, had also uh, left that little team. Well, he put his eyes on another Ontario location. The most logical place was Ottawa, but the folks who owned the Civic Center in Ottawa were not sure about the WHA either. So uh, approval of letting the WHA team play there was not forthcoming right away. Now, the new league also announced that their first ever full-scale player draft would take place in Anaheim, California, a very apropos location, I thought, given that that's where Disneyland is. And that would take place on the weekend of February 11th to 14th, and the league said that they would draft from every possible level of hockey and I'll tell you this, after looking at that list, we'll talk about it at great length when it happens, they drafted from some uh, professions that weren't even involved in hockey, believe it or not. And we're going to finish off the first half of the month with one of the more bizarre stories uh, that came out in January of 1972. Uh, by the way, this was all happening when I was hitting my 21st birthday. Uh, this is from Buffalo, New York. Uh, you might have heard this story. I had forgotten all about it till I started doing this research. Yes, hockey fans, there really is a fellow by the name of Mel Moonlight, and he'll be suiting up as a goalie for the Buffalo Sabres just as soon as he learns to skate, or possibly even sooner. The existence of Moonlight, his real name is Lee Coppola, was confirmed yesterday by Paul Wheeland, the public relations director for the Buffalo Sabres. And I thought Paul Wheeland was a great PR director, a legend in his profession, and really a genius. Now, Mel Moonlight won't be ready for this weekend's home and home series against the Montreal Canadiens because he's still trying to make the transition from street hockey to the ice game. But the club is aiming for him for a starting assignment February 27th in an exhibition match against the local fans, said Whelan. We don't know yet if he'll be on skates or in overshoes, but he says he's going to be in uniform and ready to play. 
The Sabres had issued a news release last week announcing that Moonlight, Rookie of the Year in the Niagara Street Hockey Association last season with 10 shutouts in 45 games and a goal against average of 10 a game, has been training with a local skating instructor behind closed doors. When the instructor stops laughing, we may unveil him to the public, Coach Punchimlack had been quoted as saying. Whelan said Capola, alias Moonlight is a local newspaper writer with some street hockey experience who's determined to make good on his threat to appear in uniform next month. Turning to more serious matters, Whelan said that doctors were there very satisfied with the progress of Punch him lacks recovery from the heart attack he has suffered a week ago. He's had no complications and he's reacted very well. While discussing the acquisition of Mel Moonlight, Paul Whelan also took the opportunity to announce that the Sabres has added some strength at center with the acquisition of Jim Lorenz from the New York Rangers in exchange for a Buffalo player to be named later or maybe even a draft pick. <laughs> Poor Jim Lorenz, he has to take sec- second uh, billing to a basically fictional hockey star when he makes it to Buffalo. But I'll tell you this, Jimmy Lorenz made a much bigger impact on Buffalo hockey than Mel Moonlight did. So that's this week's show, everyone. What we learn from the first couple of weeks of January. Well, we learned about a near riot in Philadelphia that resulted in the arrest of four St. Louis Blues players and coach Al Arbor. Uh, we learned that Punch Imlac was sidelined with a heart attack and everybody wished him well. And the battle for ownership of the Toronto Maple Leafs looked like it was just about ready to get pretty ugly. Now next week's show will have uh, quite a bit uh, more news. The WHA news actually became more frequent and significant. And we're going to have the headlines for you there. Uh, Vancouver Canucks coach Hal Laco. Uh, rumors were rampant that he was going to be fired while well, he learned of his future, at least for the rest of the season. And Derek Sanderson is going to explain to us why the idiotic phenomenon known as the hockey fight is inevitable in the game as it is played in 1972. And then 50 years later, we're going to still have morons like Kevin Bieksa of Hockey Night in Canada, who came out last night on the broadcast saying that he loves fights and they definitely have their place in the game. Not in a real sport, Kevin, they don't. But we'll talk about that part on another episode. So that's what we have next week, folks. The 50 Years Ago in Hockey podcast is produced by Andy Cole, now recovering from COVID as well. I can't thank him enough for all his hard work, even while he's been ill. Uh, Andy also produces podcasts professionally. If you're thinking of putting something together, get a hold of me. I'll hook you guys up. Andy's a real media professional. The very popular Juno-nominated Toronto Indie Rock Group, The Rural Alberta Advantage, provides our introduction music. If you ever got a chance to see them perform live, don't miss it. They put on a great high-energy show. Someday, we're all going to be able to get to go to shows like this again. I can't wait. Other musical pieces, sound effects are crafted by Andy Cole as well. Our research comes from files of the Toronto Star, the Toronto Global Mail, and of course the many publications found at newspapers.com. You can find us on Twitter every day at At Hockey 50 Years. We are on Facebook under 50 Years Ago on Hockey. Our WordPress site is hockey50yearsago.com. And of course, through your favorite podcast app and every week right here on the Hockey Podcast Network. Thank you to everyone who's tuned in. Thanks for all the good wishes for those of you who wished us well and a quick recovery from COVID. We're getting there. We hope you're going to be with us the rest of this 1971-72 season. And on that note, we will see you next time. When the ice